History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 26, Kant's Theory of Free Will, February 18th, 1965. I told you last time, and that was the final point in my last lecture, as far as I can now reconstruct what I, what I said then, that what is needed for a willed act or for practice in general is the coincidence of two antagonistic elements that do not become completely fused. On the one hand, there is intellect, reason, about which I would say that, if you take the notion of practice very seriously, it contains or presupposes the idea of the unrestricted, highly progressive theoretical consciousness. On the other hand, there is what I have labeled the additional factor, the body impulse that cannot be reduced to reason. I should like now to flesh out this idea with a few illustrations of what I mean. I believe that you can best obtain an idea of what I have in mind if you imagine the situation in which a man simply cannot stand by and watch any longer an incident of the kind I told you about in connection with Peter Altenberg in the context of my discussion of the idea of progress. Altenberg described a man who was so hopelessly hysterical, as he put it ironically, that he simply cannot bear to watch a coachman maltreating a horse, and so he intervenes and grabs his arm, or perhaps clouts him. I would say that where this kind of no react this kind of reaction is completely absent, where there is no indignation about the lack of freedom, there can be no room for ideas of freedom in humanity. Perhaps the gravest objection to Kantian moral theory is that it has no room for motives of this kind. In this context, when I returned from emigration, I had an encounter that made an indelible impression on me and that I should not like to withhold from you. In the first few months after my return, I met some of the very few f survivors of the bomb plot of July 20th, 1944, against Hitler, among them Herr von Schlabrin, Schlab, Schlabrin, Schlabrindorf, with whom I had a lengthy conversation. I asked him, how was it possible for you and your friends to go ahead with this plot, knowing that you faced not just death, something that might fit with a so-called heroic attitude, but things that were inconceivably more horrific than death. I told him that I could not imagine people who were able to muster the strength to look all that in the face and to go ahead in spite of it. Er von Schlabrendorf, Schlabrendorf replied without much hesitation, the fact is I just couldn't put up with things the way they were any longer, and I didn't spend much time brooding about the possible consequences. I just followed the idea that anything would be better than for things to go on as they were. I would say that this is the true primal phenomenon of moral, of moral behavior. It occurs when the element of impulse joins forces with the element of consciousness to bring about a spontaneous act. In Kant, in contrast, the situation is very different. The Kantian system, the Kantian system abounds in assertions about the radical distinction between theory and practice. And the whole modern debate about the problem of theory and practice goes back to this distinction in Kant's philosophy. Nevertheless, it is a very remarkable fact that all this notwithstanding, Kant remains under the spell of theoretical thought, even in the critique of practical reason. All the descriptions that he gives, all the explanations of morality, are themselves theoretical explanations. His own practical reason contains all sorts of ideas, and the only thing that is missing is a statement about how to turn them into practice, and about what distinguishes them from purely theoretical ideas. For the distinction he himself draws is that the object of the moral, namely action, is something that flows purely from reason. It is something brought into being by the subject, whereas all other forms of knowledge refer to pre-existing subject matter. But obviously this distinction is purely epistem epistemological, and it remains inside the entire dichotomy Kant sets up between form and content, a dichotomy that has nothing to say about the factor that actually determines the transition to practice. I have told you that the problem of freedom is historical in nature, and it is not un uninteresting to note that Kant has at least perceived the historical origins of our reflecting on freedom, even though within the framework of his system he always has to treat freedom itself as a constant, as transcendental, as something that transcends time.
There is a passage in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals that speaks of a kind of, of Copernican turn in ethics and represents this turn as what might be thought of as a significant event in the history of ideas. He states in chapter two of the groundwork that their authors, i.e. of previous efforts to ground morality, saw man as tied to laws by his duty, but it never occurred to him that he is subject only to laws which are made by himself and yet are universal, and that he is bound only to act in conformity with a will which is his own, but as nature's purpose for, its, for it, the function of making universal law. By nature's purpose, of course, he does not mean the purpose of nature with its mechanical laws of causality, but something more like the nature of mankind, the conception of mankind. This is one of the key passages demonstrating the changing meaning of the, of the term nature in Kant, and I commend it to you on passant for your own study of Kant. Incidentally, I should take the opportunity of telling you that it cannot be the task, of course, of a course of lectures like this, one, to, to reproduce the contents of books. Lectures as a form of instruction date back to a time when written books were not generally available, and they have for a very long time preserved this archaic, this archaic tradition of simply reporting the contents of, contents of books. Nowadays, when books are widely available, such a procedure would be utterly pointless. Instead, it is assumed that students can read. I believe it is not a waste of time to say this, and I do so explicitly because of problems that have arisen in connection with the new law governing universities. Moreover, it is assumed not only that students can read, but that they do read in fact. What lectures can and should provide is reflections on such reading material, reflections that are driven by theory, but are not mere reproduction. I assume, therefore, I believe I have said this already, but it will bear repetition, that you really should read and indeed study the basic works of Kant on moral philosophy relevant to these lectures. If you have not yet done so, you must do so in the vacation. Those of you who have not yet done the reading will only understand a whole series of things I have said when you have caught up with it, and I should like to say that this holds good for lectures in general. Philosophy is not a subject like law, for instance, where the lecturer tries to impart a body of knowledge that students then have to reproduce. Philosophy consists, as Kant would say, largely in philosophizing, and we must not regress to a position anterior to, the, to this Kantian definitions. Moreover, in the examinations, you cannot expect only to be asked about things I have talked about here, but you can, of course and in the first instance, be examined on things that provide the materials for the reflections that I have been offering you here. All of this is basically too obvious to need saying, but I have every reason, every reason to remind you of it. And if I ever forget to give you proper references to what I regard as absolutely indispensable reading matter, I would be grateful if you could bring this to my attention so that it doesn't get overlooked. Something that can very easily happen to someone like myself, who more or less lives in these things. The passage that I've read out to you shows that according to Kant, theoretical reflection about the universal validity and the autonomy of the moral law really comes at a later stage. However, and here is a very remarkable fact for you to ponder, the fact that theory emerges only at a late stage, and as is well known, he equates it with his own discovery, does not lead him to conclude that if in all seriousness, the categorical imperative is to be regarded as the yardstick of all right action, and that without it we cannot act morally, then it follows that all action that does not flow from this consciousness is in fact heteronomous, a form of action that is not moral at all, strictly speaking. Kant does indeed deny explicitly that this is the case, but only by appealing to natural law, to the more or less vague assurance that, even if people are not fully conscious of the moral law, it is somehow inherent in mankind as a kind of natural code, and mankind needs only to discover it. Of course, this leads to a split in the concept of reason, such that the objective reason of the moral law that is supposed to exist in every human being is said to be distinct from subjective thinking about the moral law. This split leads inevitably to a duplication of the concept of reason that is simply incompatible with the decisive theme of Kant's theory of reason, namely the unity of reason. Thus, Kant's notion here is that it was not until quite a late stage that people became aware of morality as a purely autonomous state that was both universal and also specifically tied to the individual.
and these are its two salient characteristics. It must be my own consciousness, but insofar as it is my consciousness, it must necessarily be the universal consciousness. But if we agree with Kant on this point, it follows that, it, that if reflection about freedom is historical in nature, then freedom itself must be a historical category too. This truth is in fact implicit in the Kantian system, and it was by no means overlooked or neglected. Nevertheless, although Kant arrives at this conclusion with regard to the species, he entirely fails to mention it as far as it affects the individual. The fact is that there are whole epochs in which concepts such as freedom and hence the will are completely absent. Kant is forced into all sorts of contortions to demonstrate the presence of moral consciousness everywhere, even in radical evil, just as he had argued for its presence in the minds of evildoers and scoundrels in the passages I told you about earlier. Had he not done so, he would have been compelled to admit that these periods and stages of human development that lacked a so-called sense of morality did not deserve to be called human. For an adherent of Rousseau, which, as you know, is what Kant was, this would have been intolerable. Nevertheless, at this point where he needs to demonstrate that the consciousness of freedom and autonomy actually exist, he comes into an insoluble conflict with the facts, because this claim cannot be made good in this way. I need only to remind you of the prevalence of blood vengeance in primitive societies for you to see the folly of believing in the empirical reality of the moral law as the expression of a universal law. For us to maintain that even headhunters have acted in accordance with the moral law, because that law is purely formal and without content, would surely be self-contradictory, since a universal principle according to which one man should cut off another head, another's head to the best of his ability, can hardly be deemed rational. It is an anachronism to talk of freedom before the individual has come into existence through a process of self-reflection. And when we speak of individuals here, we do not mean individual beings in a purely biological sense. What we mean are individual human beings who are capable of reflection and are constituted as individuals in a spiritual sense. The inference to be drawn from this relates paradoxically to the inner composition of the concept of freedom. For if in fact freedom and the concept of freedom fall within the scope of historical consciousness, and if they are constituted by history and are, as I have suggested, historically ephemeral, then both the idea of freedom and freedom itself must be dependent upon the world and the state of affairs in the world, even though by definition they are supposed to be independent of them and to have separated themselves off. It might be said that in a very real sense, freedom now slips into the realm of determination. In other words, that the idea of freedom and the realization of freedom really are connected with the basic categories of bourgeois society, in which so-called natural forms of dependence have disappeared in favor of the rational principle of equality and the equivalence of units of work in the course of exchange. Freedom can only be understood through the further development of this contradiction, namely as the, the determinate negation of any given concrete expression of unfreedom, not, however, as a constant of the sort envisaged by Kant in his definition of freedom. We encounter the covert interlocking of freedom and unfreedom in Kant in a passage in the groundwork of the metaphysic of morals that I would like to read to you in this connection. Now I assert, he says, and he says it with great emphasis, almost as if he were banging the table with his fist, now I assert that every being who cannot act except under the idea of freedom is by this alone, from a practical point of view, really free. That is to say, for him, for every being like him, all the laws inseparably bound up with freedom are valid, just as much as if his will could be pronounced free in itself on grounds valid for theoretical philosophy. You can see then from this quotation that this element of the dependent nature of freedom, this element of unfreedom, casts the shadow of relativity over the concept of freedom, and by the same token over Kant's absolutist ethic. This is one of the few passages where I would say that Kant in fact behaves in tune with what is later psychologizing interpreters, such as, such as Hans Wehinger, say about him, the idea of freedom and freedom itself are transformed into a fiction, and as such, as in, as if they necessarily lose the absolute validity they ought to have. It then becomes something of a necessity that, because I cannot escape from the notion of freedom, I cannot act otherwise than under the idea of freedom, regardless of whether or not freedom is a reality. 
in effect, can't a saying, because I cannot act otherwise than under the idea of freedom, otherwise than under this idea, which might well turn out to be an illusion. This means that in practical terms, every being is genuinely free. Whereas the truth is that we might infer from this quite simply, with just as much rigor and with even greater certainty, that if I possess only the consciousness of my freedom without being assured that this freedom really exists in itself, as would surely be necessary, then I am self-deceived in believing that my own actions are free actions. The doctrine of freedom thus turns out to be a necessary fiction. We might even add, in utilitarian terms, in pragmatic terms. This is because, were it not for this supposition which, according to Kant, remains theoretically unproven, I would be unable to act at all. Indeed, I would be unable to live at all. At the very point where it would have been essential to demonstrate the objective nature of the concept of freedom, and to make good its largest possible claims, to salvage them, as Kant puts it, at the point where an extreme objectivism would have been called for, we find him relapsing into a primitive subjectivism. Elsewhere, Kant's philosophy set its face against such subjectivism by maintaining that objectivity was itself constituted by the subject. You can see how deeply the antinomies that we are struggling with reach down into the Kantian theory, and how they are recorded there. It is a mark of Kant's greatness that these things always emerge clearly in his writings. But it goes without saying that he does not reflect on them as such in any detail in the critique of practical reason, or in the simpler or in the simpler groundwork on the metaphysics of morals. Kant is discussing a creature that is supposed to be unable to act, except in obedience to this idea. He is discussing actual human beings who, according to the critique of pure reason, are subject to the laws of causality. He wishes to overcome the impasse, the non liquet with which the third antinomy of the critique of pure reason had ended, namely its conclusion that the thesis of absolute determination and the thesis of infinite freedom are equally plausible. He desires to overcome this non liquet and to achieve a positive outcome for the sake of practical reason, namely by demonstrating that freedom is a given. He does not succeed, however. Despite this, he is compelled to maintain this theoretical non liquet because even in practical reason, his conclusions must be reached within the realm of theory. This is connected with the primacy of theory in his thought to which, against his will, even practical reason is subject. This explains why this non liquet keeps making its appearance. He thus finds himself constantly being forced into these rather sophistical arguments. Whatever the position of the subject, it cannot act otherwise. We are compelled to bow to the eight, to the as if. It is evident that it is precisely this attempt, and this is Kant's actual attempt to salvage his argument, to shake off the impasse of the third antinomy that forces him into mediations again and again, despite his blunt dualism. That is to say, he finds himself forced to establish a link between the idea of freedom and actual human subjects who, according to him, are supposed to be free to act. As I have already suggested, it is this maneuver that makes the idea of freedom appear curiously paradoxical. Human beings cannot act otherwise than under the idea of freedom. Their subjective consciousness is chained to it. This means that freedom has its basis in unfreedom. But in another way, the very thing that is, de that is defined in Kant's theory of freedom as rational action presupposes that rational ref reflection has been broken off. In other words, a form of behavior in which I abandon rational analysis and rational questioning, but simply float without questioning within a horizon as if I were free. And at the very point where I imagine myself to be free, I find myself dependent upon my so-called nature, my constitution, the fact that I am like this and not otherwise. This is something we have discussed at length, namely how the human subject knows that he is free. And in this sense, freedom is chained to causality. This, if you like, is the point at which the emphatic conception of nature is human nature, the concept of nature that is at work in natural law, comes together, after all, with the idea of nature as a mechanism of cause and effect, nature as something constituted, a cons constitutum, the so-called natura naturata. In other words, this is the point at which the power and the spell of the Kantian natura naturata extends its sway to include the Kantian natura naturans. The free and spontaneous human being. The idea of natura naturans is grounded in the empirical mind that is very prone to self-deception,
as we can see from countless acts of introspection. Freedom is at the mercy of the contingencies of time and space. This is a point at which we can pause and reflect on the extent to which the progress of the individual sciences has impinged upon philosophy. In Kant, it is still the case that he continues to place his trust in the born of introspection. I need only immerse myself in the hidden depths of my own mind, and need only observe whatever is stirring and whatever is going on and whatever is achieved there, and I shall be able to discover the universe and its laws within myself. Kant was ignorant of a truth that had been recognized relatively early on by the great psychologists, the moralists, people such as La Roche, Rochefoucauld, long before Kant. This, this was that even my knowledge of myself is just as imperfect, just as much at the mercy of the idola fori, the idols of the marketplace, as my conventional views of the external world. I believe that one needs only observe oneself becoming involved in some dispute or other with other people, and see how one behaves in a naive, uncontrolled way, to realize that the motives we give ourselves for our actions are always a lot nobler than they are in fact. I am often struck by this and by the way in which everyone, absolutely every human being, believes that he is in the right. Infinite intellectual and moral strength is needed to set limits to this tendency, and to refrain from claiming the moral high ground in even the pettiest details of daily life. Now, in its formal structure, this self-justification fits very well with Kant's theory of the moral law. The moral law is so similar to this, and his idea of freedom seems to be so completely modeled on this procedure that we have to admit that there is a real source of self-deception here. We might well conjecture that one of the sources, and not the least important one of the idea of the law absolutely of the sorry of the idea of the absolute nature of the good or of the moral law to which Kantian philosophy aspires, is the belief people have in their own goodness, not just in their relations with others, but also in themselves. This belief is the product of the mechanisms of rationalization and self-justification, as well as narcissism, but its most profound source lies in people's desire to ward off reproaches and criticism. We should say that the task of morality should really be to destroy this illusion instead of borrowing one's own categories from it, as is the case with Kant. The great moralists such as La Rochefoucauld and La Bruyère and Chamfort are frequently made the butt of criticism and dismissed as rhapsodic, essayistic, and fragmentary. But in this sense, they are far more radical in a moral sense than the great systematizer of morality, who would undoubtedly have looked down on them with contempt. The way in which causality and freedom interlock in Kant reveals the cloven hoof in his philosophy and the fact that almost all the so-called mediating concepts that are meant to bridge the charismos, charismos, the gulf separating the pure, intelligible sphere from that of empirical existence, are repressive in character. Whenever the moral law is supposed to reveal itself in the minds and actions of empirical human beings, in their empirical consciousness, it takes on the aura of coercion. You can easily see this by looking at his terminology, that is, the figures of speech Kant uses whenever he sets out to explain the impact of the intelligible subject upon the empirical one. He speaks constantly of law, coercion, respect, duty, and such like. Through the will, Kant says, here we have the Kantian definition of the will. I hope that I shall find time to give you a different definition of the will in the course of these lectures, which now are unfortunately drawing to an end far too soon. Kant's idea is that, through the will, reason will be able to procure reality for itself. This is the point at which all of Kant's statements converge, and reason turns out to amount to the idea of pure laws. I can't read you all the examples that I wanted to give you because there is not enough time, but I should like to read one brief passage from chapter 2 of the groundwork of the metaphysic of morals where Kant states that the will is conceived as a power of determining oneself to action in accordance with the idea of certain laws. This conception of law is derived from reason, which is designated by Kant as thinking in terms of necessity and universality, that is, as thinking according to rules. This conception of law entails restrictions on freedom, since it turns freedom into something that might be termed unfree because of the need to obey the laws. It is precisely the same motif that freedom is actually nothing but the consciousness of the law that dominates the whole of German idealism and recurs in the vulgar Marxist thesis that at the bottom 
that at bottom, freedom means acting and forcing oneself to do according to one's consciousness what objective determining factors are supposed to have made necessary. Reason creates reality for itself independently of the material. This, as I explained at the beginning of this lecture, and not its opposition to the concept of law is what defines Kant's conception of freedom. Thus, freedom is to be found exclusively in the way in which a rationality that is regarded as conforming to laws relates to the sphere of objects. Thus, freedom consists in the fact that I am not bound to any given material in order to exercise the functions of my reason, but that I can simply follow them in a pure fashion. But since, according to Kant, reason is nothing but the ability to think in accordance with laws, freedom is necessarily reduced to obedience to lawfulness. Kant finds nothing to object to in the idea that reason is determined, that it is determined by the concept of law, and that it must abide by laws. He goes even further in this respect, since his conception of reason consists in this identity of action with the conformity to law. The paradox that freedom is nothing but a conscious lawfulness lies at the heart of Kant's grounding of his ethics. It follows that if abstract subjectivity falls away, that is, if the purely legislative rationality ceases to be imagined as the absolute constituents or regulative, both are essential for Kant, this can only detract from the theory of freedom. And given what I have told you about the relation of Kant's theory of freedom to his conception of law, it is no accident that at one point in the groundwork he opts for the, for the paradoxical statement that freedom is a kind of causality. He opens chapter 3 with the emphatic statement that will is a kind of causality belonging to living beings so far as they are rational. Freedom would then be the property this causality has of being able to work independently of determination by alien causes. Thus, freedom does not mean that I do not act in accordance with laws, that I am not subject to laws. It means that these laws are to be identical with the laws governing my own rationality. However, since in Kant all the laws that actually exist are the laws of my own reason, it follows that, in the light of the definition of freedom I have just read out to you, the theory of freedom is profoundly restricted and even revoked by Kant himself. This is because, astonishingly, the laws of consciousness in Kant are thought not to impair freedom, but actually to create the conditions for its emergence. The oxymoron of causality born of freedom is based on the equation of will and reason, regarded as conformity with law. It is the supreme expression of rationalism, of what might be called the rationalist wing in the army of Frederick the Great, which Kantian philosophy draws up on parade.